So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Taras Fedirko, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Elisaveta German, a leading Ukrainian curator, art historian, and a gallerist. In fact, you might already know uh, Elisaveta by her works, which include Decumunized, um, an art book about Ukrainian Soviet mosaics, and also a beautiful art book, look it up, and also the Ukrainian pavilion at the last year's um, Venice Biennale, which um, Elisaveta um, has co-curated. And in fact, it's from this that um, I'd like to start our conversation today. Um, for the Venice Biennale, you curated uh, or co-curated a brilliant art project, uh, an installation by the Kharkiv artist Pavlo Makov. The installation, for those who aren't familiar, is called uh, a Fountain of Exhaustion, Aqua Alta. Uh, in Ukrainian, it is more fam uh, you know, better known, I think, as just a Fountain of Exhaustion, Fontan Vysnazhenia. And um, you worked on this with Boris Filonenko, if I understand correctly. And it is a brilliant art piece. It, it's, it's, for those who haven't seen it, it's a contraption of hierarchically organized sieves. At the top of it, there is one sieve which collects whatever is poured into it, water, sand, you name it, whatever can pass through. It passes it on to two sieves, which pass it on to three, three pass it onwards, all the way down to the seven or more sieves at the bottom. And as water or sand pass through the sieves, they are divided, and as they are divided, they're exhausted. Actually, it works. A more obvious way of interpreting this, and mind you, I'm not an art critic, I'm an, I'm an anthropologist, social scientist, so I turn everything back to politics and to, to metaphors of politics and metaphors of the social. We can read this, and because this artwork, it, it, the idea of it dates back to the 90s, right? We can read this as a a metaphor of the way in which Ukrainians have come to understand themselves since maybe 2013, 2014, but certainly longer. It's, it's built hierarchically, yet it's a critique of hierarchy. It's a statement about the quiet work of resistance that turns the hierarchy well, upside down, we mix in metaphors, but that destroys the effectiveness of hierarchical imposition. But at the same time, of course, it's also a critique of that collectivism. Today we are here to talk about your work on the counteroffensive of exhibitions. Your, uh, Elisabetta is writing a book which is trying to capture something of the moment in which Ukrainian artists found themselves after the full-scale Russian invasion on the 24th of February 2022. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that moment and what was so peculiar about Ukrainian contemporary artists' response to the invasion? Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you for such a uh, profound and expanded introduction to Pavlo Markov's piece, which I would like to start with, perhaps. So, as you mentioned, the idea of the piece uh, is coming from the 90s. The Pavlo Markov is the artist who started his career in 1970s, actually, but the 90s was a very crucial moment for his practice. And actually, the idea of this fountain of exhaustion and this symbol of exhaustion, this uh, image of exhaustion, is very deeply rooted into this post-Soviet Kharkiv situation. It's not a, it's, the piece is a combination of poetical references, but also very concrete social references to this post-Soviet city, exhausted, deprived from uh, um, infrastructure. I mean, those of you who remember post-Soviet 90s can recall the absence of water or electricity. Uh, and uh, the Kharkiv 90s was exactly the city, uh, the city where, uh, which didn't um, have water for week, weeks in a row. And this is actually the moment which is coming, which is we experiencing in Ukraine again. Um, and in this way, this fountain of exhaustion again gains a little bit of new meaning. So and the, the story of this piece is uh, very curious because, again, starting from 90s, it was never, the idea came in 90s, but it was never realized. Markov never, uh, was never managed to produce it as a working fountain for many different reasons. I won't go into that. But then when we uh, invited him, when we offered him to actually produce this fountain, to make it work as a fountain, specifically for the Venice Biennial, um, he immediately kind of um, answered this idea and this image of um, Aqua Alta, this, the Venice, the city which is de um, like step by step going down underwater, gave a new meaning to this fountain, uh, to this piece, and it uh, quickly became a symbol of something more than just a post-Soviet situation. It has become a symbol of exhaustion of many things like economics, politics, um, uh, other things, but then 
because we started to produce it in 2021, and we opened it on the second month of the full-scale invasion. Again, it gained some new meanings, and it beca has become a symbol of uh, exhaustion of humanity, as we used to call it um, at that moment. But then we brought this piece to Kiev mm. to exhibit in the, in the Hanenko Museum, and the Hanenko Museum is the muse one of the few, if not the only museum in Kyiv, which physically um, suffered, which was physically damaged from, from the shelling. Uh, all the windows were broken, and actually the team of the museum is heroic because they managed to do everything to open this project. We postponed it a little bit, but we opened it. And because there is, again, problems with electricity, with um, uh, heating, the, um, all the efforts that were made to install this piece, to make it work, to make this exhibition work, were just enormous. Uh, and now we're bringing this piece, piece to Kharkiv, the hometown of, of Pavlo. And as all of you know, Kharkiv was damaged much more uh, than Kyiv itself. So the more this piece actually, you know, the further it goes, um, the more it has been exhibited, the more meaning it gains. And this, I mean, I'm not... I'm, I don't want to go into this um, line of thought about the prophecism of the artists, but this piece is genuinely, you know, the one which actually predicted certain things back in the 90s. Uh, but then coming to your main question about this country offensive exhibitions, and uh, here I have to say this is not my term. I borrowed it from um, two artists. I still can't figure out who of them were the first one to tell it. It's Stanislav Turin and Katja Lipkind, artists who, both of them, who curated and opened exhibitions in Kyiv uh, after the full-scale invasion. And um, uh, there was a moment, uh, it was May and June 2023, so several months ago, when literally every day um, um, a couple of exhibitions were opening, were in Kiev, and people were just, you know, migrating, like, <laughs> bar crawling, exhibition crawling um, every day, and it was um, an amazing an amazing thing to, to follow, amazing thing to, to observe, because suddenly it's not like a pre-war situation, it's like even more active, even more fruitful, even more um, diverse and um, interesting. Um, so my observation is actually what is happening right now in Ukraine is not just a moment of, um, I don't know, high artistic productivity. Um, obviously, many artists are there. Many artists didn't leave Ukraine. Many men didn't leave Ukraine for obvious reasons. But uh, lots of artists are coming back now. So I think the artistic scene in Kyiv and especially in Lviv uh, is extremely alive. But also what is important and what is my particular subject of interest is that not only the artists work in the studios, but actually institutions or what is left from the institutions. Because uh, as you know, most of the museums in Ukraine, they don't work with their permanent collections because all the permanent collections are hidden and the storage is being protected. But institutions and what is most even more important, uh, self-organized initiatives. They exhibit this art. So the exhibition as a format, as a format of exhibiting art as a meeting point, suddenly um, has become even more relevant, even more important than it was ever before, perhaps. And if uh, we think back, if we look back at the 19th century, where the, when the exhibition as a format, as a format of public display of art emerged, because before the 19th century, the exhibitions were, let's say, a privileged uh, space for, I don't know, aristocracy or the, the academia. Um, starting from the 19th century, art exhibitions has become a public domain. Um, I think we're coming back to the similar idea now in Ukraine, where the exhibition is much more than just a place to exhibit art. This is a meeting point, this is a place for debates, and this is a place to, uh, not to exhibit just art, but to exhibit ourselves, Ukrainian art scene. We are here, we are alive, we are active, we are not defeated. I'm sorry, I'm sound maybe a little bit, you know, like, uh, too much kind of high spirit, but um, this is how it works, actually. And I think with these exhibitions, and th this is why actually this term counter-offensive of exhibitions popped up, because this is about... Uh, it, it actually also illustrates the ability to resist what is happening but, but now. But also collectively as well, right? Exactly. So as a single front, as it were. So exactly. they suggest yeah. for different spatial and temporal elements to, exactly. uh, to the organization of, of, of this resistance. Mm -hmm. There was a child of the 90s from, from Western Ukraine. I certainly recognize the, the kinds of exhaustions that the fountain of exhaustion hints at. But I... Um, as the work circulates and, and reaches people who know nothing about art in Glasgow, like me, you know, people like me, I mean, I refuse to read it pessimistically, 
um, and you talk about the self-organization that is a, a founding part of the resistance to the war. I see that work of resistance there in that work, um, of, of, uh, in Marco's work of art. Can you tell us a little bit about what has made this resistance possible? Clearly, there are longer traditions of thinking about exhibitions mm -hmm. that might reach as far back as the 19th century and, mm -hmm. and far beyond Ukraine or, or, mm -hmm. or parts of Ukraine. Uh, but in Ukraine, what forms of self-organizations um, organization have, have, have there been among artists and mm -hmm. what baggages do they carry? Mm -hmm. Now, I dare to say that self-organization and this horizontal type of work is the, one of the core elements, perhaps, of the artistic process in Ukraine, starting from, let's say, from the 60s. This is where my expertise, you know, <laughs> kind of <laughs> comes from. Um, because under Soviet censorship, obviously, there were many artistic communities which didn't have uh, enough opportunities to exhibit what was under censorship, which was not allowed to be exhibited, which was never had a chance to pass through so-called list of com and all these kind of committees which were selecting uh, what can be exhibited ideologically and formally. And what artists had to do is actually self-organize somehow themselves. And in different parts of Ukraine, actually, this self-organization um, had different forms. I would say that Kyiv was maybe less self-organized, because in Kyiv there were so-called, there's an interesting term by uh, art historian, Soviet art historian uh, Boris Lobanovsky, who called it uh, Kyiv Anachorets, Kyiv monks, because in Kyiv people, uh, artists, they didn't organize nothing like um, uh, apartment exhibitions. This was an Odessa phenomenon. This is the place where artists were truly self-organized. Apartment exhibitions, uh, so-called fence exhibition, when artists exhibited several pieces on the fence around the opera in Odessa, in the very city center. The exhibition lasted for several hours, but it was documented. There are several pictures. That's why we know how it looked like, which is amazing, actually. Um, but in Kyiv, the self-organization was not that much um, visible. It was more about, like, this anachoret, this monk um, little circles, little groups of people who gathered together to discuss, to show works to one another. But still, it is also certain form of self-organization, certain kind of um, striving to be together, to discuss something, to, you know, to kind of exhibit your works, make it a public domain. If by saying public, we mean only, I don't know, 10 people of your closest circle. In Viv, there was something different. There was um, so-called um, Academy of Roman Sielski, and then it was an Academy of uh, Carlos Virinsky, the also two kind of intellectual, artistic um, patriarchs. I, I'm sorry for using this patriarchal word, but <laughs> for the lack of, of, of the better one, I would use this. So in Viv, this kind of self-organization and um, ability to... Uh, to work together, to be together, despite the censorship, took a form of self-education circles. In Uzhgorod, it was something different. So I won't you know, give you a lecture of the 60s, I can do it for hours, but um, I think this is where this tradition of you know, doing something uh, despite the obstacles, at that moment, the obstacles were politics, were um, Soviet art system, which didn't allow certain things. Then, of course, the, the 90s which we already mentioned through the work of Pavlo Makov, where uh, when the, the artistic infrastructure, so the Soviet infra infrastructure was, it didn't collapse because the artistic union exists today and it hasn't changed much since the Soviet times, I must say. It still you know, owns a good deal of real estate around Ukraine and it still kind of works under certain criteria, which doesn't have anything to do with the real artistic world material, let's say so, but, so in, but generally in the 90s, of course, this Soviet infrastructure more or less collapsed, but the new infrastructure didn't emerge immediately. And many things that were happening in the 90s, they also happened more or less based on the self-organized um, level in a different venues, sometimes in like literally in ruins. For example, the famous uh, Kyiv Mohil Academy, the so-called um, old academic building, which later has become the, uh, the home for the um, Soros Center for Contemporary Art. Before the Soros moved in, this more or less half ruined exhibition was used by the artists who also curated it. Uh, and this ruins has become a, um, like a background, or maybe even the kind of, not just the props, but the props that inspired the artists to create something site-specific. But again, it's much about self-organization. And um, uh, then 2000, 2000s, of course, the, uh, uh, the first the Orange Revolution gave a, 
a huge impulse to the artists and the so-called, um, what we sometimes call like post-Maidan, post, um, post-Orange uh, post Revolution generation or the rap group generation. Mm. Rap group is obviously one of the most um, famous and celebrated for a reason, uh, artistic collectives that, uh, for example, Makola Didne, whose works are now exhibited in succession, belongs to the same generation. Makola did amazing things um, in this, like, let's say, Orange Revolution times, 2004, 2005. He established, he and his, his uh, colleagues from the Soska group, they established a beautiful uh, self-organized gallery in the city center of Kharkiv, which existed, I think, for 15 years, with zero budgets, with no support, but for a very long time, it served as one of the few, if not any, any real vivid center for, let's say, alternative culture. And Kharkiv is a huge city. Kharkiv is like the, you know, it's, I mean, it's a historical culture and education center, but for many, many years, until maybe like recently when Yermilov Center was opened and several other places were opened, this little, like, hut, a garage, basically, it was not a garage, it was like a little house, was the only the only place for, for musicians, for contemporary young artists to meet, to hang out, to make concerts, to make performances. And for example, when uh, Boris Mikhailov, mm -hmm. obviously one of the most famous Ukrainian and Kharkiv uh, artists and photographers, came to Kharkiv in like 2000 something, he went to the Soska place because there was nothing else to go. There was a state museum, which is, was very conservative, and it is um, um, uh, the same today. So it's amazing how the self organized initiatives actually played a huge role to establish several generations of Ukrainian artists. The same thing was in Lviv and Uzhgorod, where the movement of apartment exhibitions, garage exhibitions, self-organized exhibitions of different forms and shapes was very powerful in 2010s. And this is something also researched a little bit and uh, um, gave, it was like a start, many, so many artists who are now very famous, like open group, Uzhgorod Lviv-based art artistic collective, started from this self-organized galleries. Zero budget, as I said, uh, like no support for years, no, any recognition from any, I don't know, Ministry of Culture or any other like proper <laughs> institution. But these were places which made difference, which made huge impact. And coming back to present day, I think the reason behind why the artistic scene in Ukraine proved to be so livable and so active in the darkest circumstances, because obviously the full scale invasion is the worst which mm. that can happen to the country, to the scene, it's much worse than the decline of 90s or, I don't know, uh, lack of financial support of 2000 or 2010. But the reason why this um, kind of livability is still there is that because I think it's more or less in our DNA, this ability to, you know, to self-organize, to kind of self-initiate certain things more or less from day one. Because I know many initiatives which emerged like on the during literally the first week of full-scale invasion, people were sitting at home, were never living, uh, were, because in Kyiv, in the first days, there were like 72 hours of curfew. You couldn't just, you know, leave your house. And we were all chatting, calling it one another, well, let's do something, you know? I mean, yeah, we, we are at home, like, a little bit like a COVID, but, you know, different situation. Let's, let's do something. Let's, you know, we have Facebook chat, let's kind of initiate things. And, Let's coordinate, exactly. And I mean, from day one, many, many things were coordinated um, in Kyiv. But then let's not forget, of course, about Ivano-Frank, Kyiv, and Lviv and Uzhgorod, which were under less threat in the beginning, though I know everyone were confused, of course, and scared, obviously. But, uh, for example, in Ivano-Frank, the artistic residency, which was called Working Room, Robocha Kimnata, I think, emerged during the first week of, of the full-scale invasion, and the, the coordinators of the gallery, which is called Assortment na Kimnata, Assortment Room, uh, just quickly organized an artistic residency for the artists who relocated from different parts of Ukraine to ivano frankivsk And they thought that, well, it's not just our mission to give shelter and to provide place to live, but we also have to give the artists a place to, to do something together, you know? And I think it had a very important psychological effect. This is something I learned from, I learned from many artists who said, we were so confused, we were so disoriented. And the ability to come to the workshop and talk to your peers, talk to your friends, and do something, maybe not like, you know, produce paintings or installations, of course, it was maybe a little bit out of question, but at least to talk, you know, to share, 
to share. Um, so it was like a little bit like a therapy, but also the therapy gave actually amazing artistic results because um, what was produced during this residency or later as a result of this residency was later exhibited in Vienna, in Berlin, in all other places. So uh, we, we can actually now go and see the exhibitions which show us the products or the fruits of this very immediate um, thoughts and traumas and reflections and emotions. I mean, emotion is again a little bit, you know, not maybe professional artistic word to use, but, you know, when it comes to war, maybe it's not that mm. irrelevant anymore. So, yeah, so, yeah, so I claim that this self organization impulse, as I call it, it's very much, it's something very Ukrainian, if I may. Uh, I'm sure it's not just, a, you know, just a specific Ukrainian feature, but in Ukraine we do have this, you know, this um, kind of almost like a DNA ability, you well, know, to do this kind of thing. Certainly the fact that, that several generations through, through the decades have had to self-organize. First because of a strong state that was taking away institutional possibilities and then from because of a weak state that was taking away institutional possibilities mm -hmm. suggests that it might not just be a continuity in and of itself that responds to the conditions but something that, you know, is there, as you say, in the DNA, right? So something that's part of a tradition. Um, the jury's out on that. Um, but one thing that you mentioned, um, talking about the self-organization in 2010, around, and, and before that, right, uh, with Mikola Ridney, you mentioned the names of groups, of artistic groups, Rupa Rep, Soska, mm -hmm. others, right? So it's, it's not just a self-organization of people who do stuff together, it, it's people who converse and work together, and converse about art in a way that leads to a lasting mark on the artistic language and a form of artistic expression. And of course we know, turning back to exhibitions that, that this, um, and the present time, um, through the history of, of the history of modern art and contemporary art is punctuated with remarkable exhibitions that are remembered as moments that initiated new artistic schools, directions, uh, new forms of inter interpretation, reinterpretation of the past with this counter-offensive exhibitions, which is a, not just a moment of collaboration and coordination, but clearly a moment of, of exuberance and of creativity, do you see any new artistic, form of artistic expression, new ways of talking about the war, or, or, or depicting the war, or maybe not the war, something else emerging? Mm -hmm. Is the war and the responses to it, are they changing Ukrainian art on artistic terms? Mm -hmm. Um, I would start with something um, kind of banal, uh, but I can avoid saying this, is that at this stage it is still maybe too early to make like some general conclusions about the artistic language, if it, if it has changed or not, but there are several, several observations, of course, to share from my perspective. Also, I need to say something very important, I should have said it before. I, re I moved from Ukraine, I relocated uh, in April 2022, so, you know, I'm like speaking as an expert, but <laughs> expert which actually observes from the distance. But what allows me, you know, to speak uh, as a member of artistic of Ukrainian communities, because of course I'm like very much an insider, and during this year and a half I maybe talked and saw and met most of colleagues, peers, friends who are dear to me, but also whose opinion and whose observations I trust. So also try, you know, through people, through, through this communication, through a very kind of insider's perspective I also try to you know to grasp what was happening there but I also have this a little bit like um, um, an easy you know moment that if I am allowed to speak about Ukraine not at all being relocated but I'm coming back actually I'm moving back to Ukraine quite soon so you know <laughs> maybe my you'll perspective you'll regain yeah my, maybe my yes. perspective will, will, will shift again but nevertheless I think um, one of the interesting things which I heard from the artist Stanislav Turina, who actually said about uh, counter-offensive ex exhibitions, when I actually asked him similar question, like, do you feel that, you know, the art has changed, or like in what way, he said, an interesting thing which I still kind of, you know, try to process is that the artist, um, uh, the artist and art, um, it feels to him um, this way, um, has become a little more safe, uh, or like, um, mm, oh my God, I'd say, like safe, like kind of... Less critical? And, like, careful. Yeah, careful, care, yeah, careful, yeah, careful is a good word, sorry, it's like a simple word, but I forgot, like more careful. And he couldn't explain in, in which 
in which way particular, also because he was very carefully saying about this carefulness. But I think, I, I, I feel um, uh, this explains actually um, that there are so many sensitive topics to talk about this war, of course, like, you know, Bucha, massacres, all these kind of things, and, you know, life in the occupied uh, cities and territories, which is still so, so kind of, it, topics which are still bleeding, that I think this safeness, this secureness, or this careful carefulness is actually um, one of the expressions of respect towards this, because I think what Ukrainian society is, goes through now, um, maybe for the first time in the, um, since the independence, is that we as a society actually learn to, to remember things, learn to work with the trauma. Because, for example, the, the topic of Holodomor, or even more the topic of Holocaust, has, have, ne have, ne have not been spoken through, discussed to, you know, the way it should have been discussed. Again, for many reasons, we're not going into mm -hmm. this, but I think what also this, uh, this war, this stage of war, this full-scale uh, invasion stage, also teaches us as a society, but also artists, is to actually, you know, speak about the trauma of this deepness and, you know, painfulness. And to do it, we need to be very careful. And I think this, this, this carefulness is a little bit about that. But also it's about, um, if I may dare to say, be uh, afraid to say something which is not patriotic enough. And here I need to explain myself. There is no, I mean, um, because there is a very you know, thin line between, you know, being patriotic in the way that you speak on behalf of Ukraine, but also not to, you know, kind of um, uh, being caught up inside of the nationalistic or kind of exuberantly patriotic discourse. And I think this is a thin line which artists also try to, to balance. So far, I don't see any red lines or any danger of Ukraine not seeing, you know, being too much. Uh, no, I mean, obviously there are, but it's not like, I mean, I think we're still, you know, more or less on the safe zone, gen like in a safe, safe space here generally. But uh, I think this carefulness actually is because artists do afraid, are afraid of, you know, you know, being too much critical towards what is happening in Ukraine, but also to be not critical at all, being too patriotic or being too kind of positive, you know. So, and mm -hmm. this, this is like this a little bit like discursive, you know, uh, carefulness. I think is, um, is a complicated thing, and I'm really actually curious how we will, um, you know, work with this. But uh, another, I think, important thing to say is that, uh, like, um, well, one of the reasons of this uh, self-organization impulse in 90s or in 2000 or in 2010 was because the state and the institutions of the state rep represented by the state, like Ministry of Culture, I don't know, many national museums, especially out of Kyiv, they were not very much active or, um, yeah, very much active and supportive, for better or worse, maybe for better, actually, into the, into the real contemporary process. And now the state is also uh, busy with something else, like with heritage protection, with cultural di diplomacy. It's maybe the work which is done is not enough, but they're trying, we are trying. So I think the art scene, again, is more or less, the contemporary art scene is more or less, again, on its own, because, again, as I said, most of the exhibitions, most of the important projects are done by, you know, horizontal, horizontal like NGOs, uh, some small institutions, private institutions, um, right, and maybe just a couple of state museums doing something, but, again, not because there is some state commission, but basically because museum directors, like Yulia Vaganova, director of the Hanenko Museum, who is doing, you know, just more than she can, actually, and not just to protect the, the, the collection, which is a beautiful collection of, uh, as they call it, like Western and Oriental art, for the lack of better word again. Mm -hmm. Here, um, they're doing contemporary exhibitions. They also try to open up the space for something different. So, um, so this, again, the state is not intrusive right now, and there are some, for example, there are... Mm, in the cinema and in the film industry is different. There is like many scandals or let's call it discussions, heated discussion, heated, heated debates right now about what kind of films or film productions receive state support. And of course, they, they're being criticized for being too much patriotic. But then there is independent film industry which lacks support, for example. So, I mean, the, the debate of 
how and in which ways and with what messages the state has or ha has must or must not intrude is the separate topic, but contemporary art scene, I will generalize it like this, I, th I think still acts more or less independently without the state support, and I think it's a good thing, actually. This is what makes it, you know, still quite critical. So clearly there is uh, so much to unpack here, as, and in that word carefulness as well, I mean, there's a whole world in there, not just care, right? But, but censorship, self-censorship, um, reflection on what can and cannot be said and what is appropriate in a particular way, who can laugh about what, mm -hmm. who can criticize what. And I think the war has obviously papered over many differences in the Ukrainian society um, because it's not just in art that people are trying to self-organize and, and, and try to act collectively and uh, rethinking what collectivity means for, for Ukraine, which is a very diverse country. But it has also created new cracks, and you've hinted at some of them. And right now there is um, a very fierce discussion, uh, as you euphemistically called it, um, because Ukrainians use untranslatable and frankly impolite words for, um, for this, um, which we'll not repeat here. But um, there are fierce discussions across the cultural sphere in Ukraine and beyond. Think of Masha Gessen, for example, uh, about taking or not taking part in international events uh, where Russian artists or Russian curators, Russian writers are present, giving or not giving stage, supporting or not supporting, appearing as a voice alongside other voices or not. And here it's a sign of Ukrainians being, first of all, m made to think, or, or people, the war makes us all, as, as Ukrainian citizens, be very aware of the fact that we might be seen or we see ourselves as representing the whole, the whole of the country, with its many, many differences, which is an impossible situation, and I don't wish it to, to anyone, frankly. But this is also a moment where um, sp speakers, writers, artists from Ukraine have been integrated into global discussions um, that are raging around the poles of inclusion and exclusion, platforming and not platforming, censoring versus giving voice. This, this new kind of identity politics that is new to Ukraine as an idiom of expression. And very often Ukrainians' lack of desire, to put it politely, to take part on the same platforms with um, Russian artists and, or, or, or Russian speakers is interpreted as simply as no platforming, as another form of identity politics. Can you please explain us what is at stake for Ukrainian artists taking part in these debates, not vis-a-vis -vis foreign audiences, but vis-a-vis -vis each other in an artistic community? Mm -hmm. Why do Ukrainian artists or artists from Ukraine care so much um, about being seen um, or not being seen as part of larger communities, but Russians or, or others in them? Mm -hmm. um, no, you're very right. There is like an endless discussion uh, as you said, not only for artistic community, but for literary community, for cinema community, for many other cultural, not only cultural communities, about like if or if not to participate in panels, exhibitions, festivals, so, so on and so forth, together with, with the representatives of Russia, the same in sports and like Olympics and, all, and so on and so forth. And um, Again, I don't want to generalize, I don't want to speak you know, on behalf of each and every one, but um, there is one, li one line of discussion which can be generalized as no, we should not, we must not participate in any form of you know, shared project by um, uh, Russian artists or curators or Russian institutions or institutions with transparent and hidden Russian money behind. And we all know that there are a lot of Russian money in, in like global international culture, and it's still there, and I think it will be there for um, for some time. And um, um, you know, one has to be a detective sometimes, you know, to actually you know go find the truth if there is any like you know Ruski Sliet, like this Russian kind of uh, uh, yeah 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 pr 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 print behind this or that organizations or biennial or whatever. And um, this topic is indeed very sensitive, and there is like one line of discussion, yeah, which says, as, as, as I started to, to explain, that no, we won't participate in any kind, like no collaboration, no cooperation is possible right now, because we, these two communities, the Russian community and Ukrainian community, we speak from 
very different positions. You know, one position is actually we speak from from the community, which is you know still under physical threat. And as I said, many artists has, have never left Ukraine. You know, and they're still you know they might produce a new work for the new exhibition, and they might be you know doing it in the complete darkness uh, in a cold apartment in the winter because there is no electricity, for example, or they had to leave their home and live somewhere else. And this um, kind of um, physical condition, this sensitivity towards these things cannot be, you know, moved away from the exhibition. You cannot be just artists who produce works without, you know, thinking about the background of the production of this work. So this is like one position. We are, we are Russian and Ukrainian artists are speaking from very, very difficult, different ethical and physical, you know, literally physical position. That's why, you know, there is, I mean, there is no dialogue because this, this level of, you know, of kind of awareness and level of, I don't know, um, just sensitivity is very different. Um, also, I think it has to do, of course, with this, um, like, just more general movement against um, this kind of... Because, I mean, we all know that Ukrainian art and Ukrainian culture in general was much underrepresented, and one of the reasons for that is, of course, that Ukraine has also not done its own homework, in a way, because the cultural diplomacy is the task for the country, not for any countries, but for your own country. But at the same time, um, it was, uh, and on Konstantin's panel, the things we discussed on the, on the uh, example of, of modernism, for example, yeah, that uh, uh, many artists were labeled, sometimes just like literally labeled on the museum label as Russian artists, and this is a good example of how actually Ukrainian art was sometimes exhibited in many curatorial projects as certain, like, you know, younger sister, almost like in USSR times, you know, when, mm. you know, on this, all this social realist painting, the, the Moscow, uh, the kind of um, guy in a, in a suit, which represented Moscow, Russia, kind of hucked the, uh, like, a shorter uh, person in less, the, in, in, in the Shivanko, yes. of course, in, in the national traditional costume, so it was just a very... So, and uh, this kind of image, lived on in a different, in a different, um, um, in a different combination. But I think what this kind of protest again against exhibiting together is also protest uh, against this model of, you know, kind of forced or artificial coexistence representing like this post-Soviet art scene or Eastern European art scene or you name any sort of, you know, generalization. So I think this is uh, this is the point, but also it also um, has to do something on a private level because um, I mean I can say for my I can, you know give you my example, but also example of many many other artists and colleagues with whom I spoke. Um, you know when they say like oh, yeah, but many Russian artists are cultural practitioners. They they immigrate, they relocated. They are, of course they are solidary. Uh, they um, express solidarity with Ukraine. They're against war. But I personally, and I'm not alone. I swear. Like I, you know, no, I I have received not like not a single message from any of the people from from Russia whom I knew, except a few friends who are actually Ukrainians who lived in, in in Russia and also. But this is like a separate topic. But I haven't received much, you know, sympathy and solidarity and nothing like that. You know, although I received like tons of messages from people who, whom I met like ten years ago on an occasional panel somewhere in Berlin, in whose name I don't remember, but they kind of remember that there is someone in Ukraine. You know, and they text me like, "Do you need a place to stay? How can you?" So this is like, I haven't received any message from him. And, and I think this is also which it, it means, it does make sense, you know. So how can you, you know, share the solidarity to a person who was forced to leave Russia because the war started when you haven't received any solidarity and any sympathy in return when there was a time to receive it. So, I mean, I just gave you a few examples maybe, um, but... Uh, I also don't want to generalize, and I don't want to say that this position is shared by every single artist and curator in Ukraine. There are multiple visions, and I think all of them deserve respect. Um, and um, again, at, at the panel of, uh, of Konstantin, we, um, the word Pushkin popped up uh, a bunch of times, and there is, for example, the institution which is called Pushkin House in London, which hosted many exhibitions of, of, of many exhibitions of Ukrainian artists in the past year and a half. And again, there is a debate, of course, if 
if this institution is protest enough, or maybe just the word Pushkin is enough to reject it and to kind of cross out um, from the list. And it only shows that there is, of course, not, it's impossible to have one solid, clear criteria of what is, you know, what is forbidden, what is banned, what is wrong, ethically wrong, and what is um, acceptable, you know, maybe, somehow. It, it is a discussion, and I think, um, the reason why we have the discussion, the reason why we have this Facebook debate, uh, which has a particular word in Ukrainian language, which we don't, <laughs> don't say it now. Um, uh, I mean, I also think this is, this is good. It's good that we have these discussions, and it's good that we don't have this one solid criteria, because one solid criteria means that there is, you know, a frame of steel which you know limits you so the more the, the more that we discuss the more maybe we kind of you know reach certain point of mutual understanding but uh, there are some ethical ethical kind of limits and again i'm not speaking about all the artists all the culture and practitioners but a big part of them actually more or less you know so uh, like share solidarities that you know shared panels shared exhibitions it's just too early for it because it will be too much complicated to speak about certain things in the same voice and the same manner. Thank you. There is many, many more questions that I would like to ask, but I will not abuse my privilege. Today we began uh, this, this evening. We began talking about fountain of exhaustion as a metaphor that might frame our discussion. But I would like to go back to to return to another image that. Uh, gave us in, in a previous talk, which is the metaphor of permanent revolution. I would hope that we're moving from a fountain of exhaustion to a permanent revolution as a way of thinking about Ukrainian art. Now I'd like to open up to the, your questions from the floor. Oh, there are many. Good. <laughs> I want to make a short comment and kind of question. First, don't overuse DNA metaphor. I think that it fully belonged to Vyacheslav Nikonov, known as the Molotov Ribbentrop grandson, a uh, Putin ideologist who made famous, uh, uh, wrote famous article about special Russian DNA, which has additional chromosome uh, absent in all other nations. No DNA. Uh, so, uh, another comment which I... I think we can claim it back, you know, and bring it to our own territory I'll, and make it great again. <laughs> uh, another question which I want to just to clarify. You know, Kyiv usually was in different situation. And we are forgetting, we, now we are falling into idealized version of Ukraine, which never was there. I am old enough to remember 1980s in Kyiv. It was a communist Jurassic Park. The land of freedom was in Moscow, in Tallinn, in Belisi, but not in Kyiv. Of course, in comparison to Kyiv, Odessa and Lviv were very nice places. When I came back to Kyiv after education, uh, graduating from Moscow University, it was a bunch of Ukrainians coming back. All of us came through KGP, all of us. You could not come there and not be, for soft porn, which in Moscow could not be even noticed because it was common occurrence. It's not surprising that we have so-called the generation of Kiev railway station. It's not surprising that at that moment Ukrainian artists had to run to Tallinn to survive and not to go to KGB. We did not get too much of solidarity during that time. Because if we were starting to talk to each other, one of us for sure could be KGB informant. So, no, let's, uh, it started after the fall. It was in the 60s, of course. But by the 80s, these people were absolutely exhausted. I remember coming to Rybaychuk and Milnichenko, who were happy that they can whisper to me something. Uh, and uh, to us. it was a very, very bad time. So when we were, we were starting really from, from, from the 90s, mm. and that was the first generation, which was after long, after the 60s, after this break, mm. became uh, kind, of, kind of unleashed. Uh, and the other thing which I just want to mention, for your interest, that 
uh, in the marriages, we have not to forget that Soros Foundation really played the role of the alternative ministry of culture. Without Soros' money, which were thrown very, very often without thinking, we could not have what we have now. So we have Cannot to be more. Yeah, to have to be grateful to all men. And then the interesting question, the really question of what we are facing now. And of course, it's not probably time to discuss it even, because it's very difficult. I told today that emotionally it's understandable. Is it forgivable? It's another question. But it's understandable. And unfortunately, very often, Today, like you know what's going on in Berlin, we will see what will happen in London after uh, exhibition in Vienna. Uh, Ukrainians are very often are shooting themselves in the feet. It's becoming a national sport. Uh, because I am understanding all emotions, but really we have to come to case by case basis. We have to be a bit more uh, diplomatic and a bit more understanding the Western context because sometimes when we are cancelling, we are cancelling ourselves. And uh, it's interesting that you address this topic, but I think that we need m much more discussion and we are not ready for this discussion, unfortunately. Mm. You've been treated to an example of Ukrainian discussions. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I think this is a wonderful yeah. example. I no, suggest we, we take know, another question. Yeah, no, if you can quickly mm -hmm. maybe yeah. comment. No, thank you so much for, 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 I mean, for everything you said, of course. And I mean, I, I definitely don't want to idealize the Ukrainian community and say that, yeah, this is like a land of freedom. And yeah, I mean, there was like this famous Soviet expression that uh, uh, when in Moscow they cut your nails, in, in Kiev they cut, uh, you know, your, your like, sh sh like till, till shoulder, something like this. And there was like lots of uh, like uh, uh, self-censorship and there was lot of like uh, pressure and um, like all these terrible things from, from the inside. There is a beautiful book of uh, Sergei Kelchik, Ukrainian Can Can Canadian art historian, Stalin's Empire of Memory, where, where actually he explains, like really like document-based, how many decisions taken in 50s and 60s were actually coming not from Moscow, as we sometimes believe that yeah, it was everything was just you know taken down from Moscow, but many many things were actually produced and brainstormed inside of the Ukrainian party, um, like other KGB, whatever. But uh, so of course I'm not idealizing I, I, idealizing here and this kind of um, like. Um, the stoy, untranslatable uh, word, uh, didn't stagnation. Yeah, didn't come uh, from nowhere. Definitely. Um, but I was what I was trying to say is that you know this kind of um, like resistance, if only in a form of you know this Odessa apartment exhibitions. And I know for sure. I, I don't know for sure because it was not there, obviously. But I know from the artists uh, who participated then, who are still alive, like Marinuk and others, that of course they were KGB people on these exhibitions. And they knew them, and they even make jokes, yeah, but because it's Odessa, of course we knew, like, the KGB is my peer. I mean, this, you know, like, making jokes out of it is also the form of, you know, kind of tolerated, but uh, um, still something, something, was, was, was something was brewing, something was happening. So at least there was, like, not a total stagnation, not a total, like, you know, just uh, uh, pressure and hammer and, yeah. Um, no, and about the case-by-case -case discussion, I, tot I totally agree here. We, we, as, long, and as long as we discuss, as long as we even make this Facebook heated discussions, I think it still means that we are able to talk to one another, even if sometimes it's, you know, on the border of, you know, tolerance and um, a little bit too heated, a little bit too aggressive sometimes, let's face the fact. It's still discussion, and I agree with you, and I think this is something which we, as a, as a society, as a cultural society, need to learn, definitely to to take these discussions, to you know, yeah, to to be able to discuss, not to cancel, not to cancel ourselves, not to cancel our own members of our own community, if they even if they participate in the in, in the projects which other part of the community rejects. But we, I mean, the Ukrainians doesn't have to cancel Ukrainians, you know, I can, I think this is not, not the time to do it, but to learn, to, to tolerate one another and to be able to speak. Yeah, this is, I think, and this is the, the, the homework which, has, which we need to learn to do. And I think the 
complicated, difficult times are ahead. What we have now, the discussions we have now, I think it's just the, just the, the beginning. It's just right? the beginning. Yeah, and I mean, after the war, that, that's the time when we have a discussion, not only about art, definitely, but I'm kind of getting myself ready for this discussion after, after the war, including the question where, like, which I addressed myself, you know, am I allowed now to give you a lecture about, you know, it's not a lecture, it's a conversation, obviously, but, you know, to kind of speak on the behalf of the community while I am myself not there. I'm doing exhibitions here in Vienna, I also think this is important, this cultural diplomacy is a separate thing, but some things I haven't witnessed, and this, you know, this uh, idea of witnessing, this is something which Nikita Kadan, the artist Nikita Kadan, works with, this kind of topic of witnessing, of, you know, being able to, you know, to, to speak, like, from, from the first person, is very important. But um, I think this discussion also of who um, holds the right to speak on behalf of who mm. is also awaits, awaits us, and we shouldn't be afraid of that, we should get ourselves ready and collect our arguments, you know. So some time for discussion is in the future, but we still have some time for discussion now. Right, right. And we have more questions. I think there was a question here from um, Ivan. Thank you very much. Ivan Vevoda with the Institute for Human Sciences. Thank you for really a fascinating and very open uh, presentation of the situation, no matter where you sit or stand. Uh, just a quick question, uh, maybe a few words about Western colleague gallery solidarity with you after February 24th, beyond the IWM, which we know is doing uh, great work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for the question. Um, now, obviously, there was and there is still a lot of support. I must say, uh, uh, of course, it decreases by the time, as, as the time passes, um, which is maybe natural. What I think is not a good sign is that, um, I mean, I will put it the other way. In the first like six months of the first year, there was like lots of attention, lots of uh, support, lots of exhibition invitations, la la la, but everything was very, uh, it was like an emergency response. Let's do something tomorrow. Let's open up the residency next month. Let's do something, you know, in two months. This was the horizon of planning. But what the Western, Western institutions, let's call it this way, are not ready for, I feel, and maybe this exhibition which Konstantin uh, curates is a good exception of it, is they're not ready for a long-term collaborations, you know, to do a big, solid historical show. And again, what we're doing is an exception differently. And there are some others, but it's rather exceptions than a, a rule, you know. Not ready to invest in all senses of this word, like time, energy, finances, expertise, and doing something major, profound, and not just a emerging response for, you know, for artists and curators who need to be supported right away, because this support has to be long term. So, so yes and no, there is plenty of support. I mean, I, I'm, I've been based in Vienna, next to Vienna, uh, for the past um, like 18 months. And I personally did many things here with very like, genuine you know, solidarity and understanding and interest. It was not just a you know, kind of um, refugee support or something like this. It was an interesting professional dialogue. And I'm very grateful to the city of Vienna and to all my colleagues you know, who, who had these dialogues with me. But, Again, when it comes to, uh, I repeat myself a little bit, yeah, to a more kind of long-term collaboration, I think carefulness, again, you know, stands in. So the institutions, museums, and decision makers are a bit much too careful. <laughs> uh, Misha Gabuc, University of Vienna. I want to go back to the, the situation inside Ukraine. So um, you talked about the relationship between contemporary artists. You talked about the relationship or lack of a relationship between contemporary artists and the state. I want to hear a little bit more about the relationship between contemporary artists and Ukrainian society. Um, there's a book by the historian Jay Winter about the First World War, where he argues that big wars lead to interesting avant-garde experiments in art but they also create a demand on the part of society for really archaic, really traditional forms of art. Is that something that you're seeing in the Ukrainian case, that there's the, all this effervescence that you're describing in terms of artistic creation, but then people who are far removed from the art scene really want something much more traditional? Mm -hmm. now this, yeah. let's, let's take another question, because I think we're running out of time. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have another question here. 
and then um, I can maybe answer most because I have it's a good question. I have an answer for that. No, uh, oh. Natalia Gomenu, Kiev based uh, journalist. My question is why all of you say it's too early? I don't really understand. Is it like just postponing the difficult issues? I'm based in Kiev. I don't see the reason to postpone anything because I concern rather than if there would be consensus now, it would be more difficult. Uh, so I, I, I really think like, aren't we just imposing that and there is a time to do it now because there is an urgency and maybe tomorrow won't come. For us, based in Kyiv, maybe it's, it's really our last option to discuss. We don't know what happened. Okay, can I answer then like step by step? Um, again, from what I learned from, from, from the colleagues, and this is actually, this was a specific question which I asked most of them during interviews, during conversation, like what about the audience? You know, well, okay, we are doing exhibitions to, you know, yeah, as I said, to be together, to discuss among peers, but what about the audience? And there were several exhibitions of a really large scale, like there is a place called Ukrainian House in the Kyiv city center, a former Lenin Museum, which was like rearranged as a, um, a cultural exhibition center. Um, uh, and there was an exhibition which was called How Are You? And this is the, 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 the sentence, the question which, you know, people in Ukraine ask, you know, one another when they meet, like, how are you, like, how do you feel, how, it's like just, a, you know, the expression of, I don't know, sympathy and um, um, care. Um, and this was a, maybe one of the first, if not the first, exhibition which uh, had an ambition to, yeah, not to wait for too long, but to kind of make some kind of... Uh, uh, preliminary conclu well, conclusions to show what the wartime Ukrainian art is about. And it was a huge exhibition, like 100 artists participated, and it was, it was just like amazingly well visited. There was like, and we know it for sure because, you know, they sell tickets, so they know exactly that they were like, I don't know, up to, I don't remember the statistics, but like a couple of thousand visitors, which is quite a lot, up to 10,000 visitors, I think, during one month. And, um, and they, it was just like a general audience, uh, and the reaction uh, uh, which was expressed during the curators' tours, during the artist talks, where people actually came to listen and came to talk a little bit, um, the reaction can be summed up that people really came, the audience really came to, to kind of um, maybe find a visual or sensual or poetic or whatever, like artistic visualization or illustration to their own you know, feelings to their own emotions. So this exhibition was kind of, you know, also had this ther like therapy effect a little bit. But this exhibition was not nothing but nothing about traditional art. It was like all the forms of, you know, artistic experiments, all the forms of. There was like um, artists from the psychiatric clinic. There was artists with Down syndrome. So they were all. They really tried to, you know, to. Um, display and to represent all the different, you know, all the different um, um, levels of artistic scene. And this was actually why this exhibition was also criticized by professionals, because um, someone who said it was like too inclusive, because they tried to, you know, there were artists who were, you know, out of artistic scene before the war, but during the war they created something, and I'm not talking about war posters or some too straightforward, simple illustration, but some of the artists who really started to produce some, you know, interesting art during this period. So, uh, but what is interesting that after this, the next exhibition in the same exhibition hall was the exhibition of Maria Primachenko, which is the, like, uh, so-called, like, naive. Again, it's a de debated debate. There is no actually, you know, there's many, many, many terms to, to coin this, like non-professional naive, but uh, um, definitely one of the most, like right now, one of the most. Actually, this is an interesting topic to discuss. Actually, why why this kind of art has become also very, you know, very visible, very demanded, internationally also. But this exhibition, I think, went beyond any expe expectations when it came to a number of visits. People were just, you know, queuing to get in, and the ticket was quite expensive. And it's, it was not just a free exhibition; you really had to buy a ticket for, I don't know, 150 grivnas, which is not too much, but which is still, you know well, some money you have to spend for this. And it was, it was just like crowded. Um, so I cannot say that this is a traditional art. It's definitely not, but um, it's very, 
I mean, it has its roots into the national tradition. It's like it has this kind of dialogue with folklore. She was a self-taught artist. She was illiterate, so it's it's a, it's a very interesting actually personality, Primachenko. You know, we can talk a lot about it. But I think this was also something you know which gave some food for thought. You know, why this kind of exhibition? But again, the contemporary art exhibition was also very very popular. So I don't know if I answered your question, but definitely not only the you know kind of. Um, traditional or, you know, straightforward type of art is being, you know, demanded, but also exper experimental art. Um, answering uh, your question, uh, Natalia, um, I, <laughs> I only said once that it is too early to make conclusions, and the reason I, I said that is because the war goes on, and I think the art will, you know, be kind of looking for, and still looking, will be looking for new images, for new... Did I miss it? Oh. Sensitive talks, because you know, like they should be time for complications. No, definitely. Okay, yeah. Conclusions. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, sorry, I miss, misunderstood a little bit. No, I mean you're very right that um, yeah, it's not a time to be afraid to speak. Definitely, especially yeah, for, for, from the, yeah, if not now, when <laughs> basically. Yeah. So, yeah, but, but again, you know, I like I quoted one of the artists. Perhaps there are other opinions, but I still think that. You know, like there is like actually another interesting trend, which perhaps worth mentioning, is that um, a number of artists who never before before the full scale invasion never worked with um, um, non uh, abstract art or non figurative art painting started to do so, but in a different ways, um, which was which is a certain response also towards the inability to speak directly about certain things because you don't want to be too direct you don't want to be you know you don't want to be make a reportage you know you don't want to be you know make it, produce another but documentary also the war might be beyond representability yeah so something right. like and and then this kind of abstract art mm -hmm. For example, um, what Katya Buchatska did when she, the artist, when she uh, she visited uh, uh, Mashun and Bucha and Rpin and all these like um, cities and towns around Kiev, which were occupied and destroyed in case of Mashun. What she did, I mean, she was also thinking how to reflect on it, what to do with this experience. Actually, you know, to find yourself in the ruins and like it's burnt, like literally burnt soil. What she did is she collected um, collected. Um, uh, soil, pigment, clay, soil, and kind of made her own um, paint out of it. You know, using traditional traditional methods of you know mixing the oil with pigment and like eye yolk and um, and that and actually painted with this. And uh, again, you know, it might be you know it's it's I mean it's an interesting approach, and it doesn't mean that it's like an ideal solution to make things like that. But for her, it was I think the method to address, to speak about the, this place, the physicality of these places in a very direct manner, because the physicality of this horror which she experienced there was inescapable. You know, you just you need to kind of process this in some way. But also, um, for her, it was a method also not to go into directness, you know, to kind of to bring this experience to her canvases. And, I mean, she's not a painter per se. She's not just like, um, you know, the, she do many kind of artistic mediums, but... Um, I think uh, it's an uh, interesting example of, and this this series was produced, I think, during the first months of the full-scale invasion, and also it differs. You know, these immediate reactions of the first six months, let's say, and today are very different. So, you know, we also cannot compare what was produced a year ago, which, with what is produced right now, because of course there are many events which are happening. Uh, right now and has been happening that of course shifts your, your vision and changes approaches and so on and so forth yeah but, uh, but I'm very agree with, with you Natalia that uh, of course you know yeah it's not a time for silence it's not a time for self-censorship so let's see how it goes further you know <laughs> kind of to what extent the the, the braveness and uh, of the the artists and art commenters at myself you know can go <laughs> so solidarity new techniques not time for censorship, time to act now. Thank you for giving us a sense of the contemporary debates and also the stakes of these debates in the Ukrainian contemporary art community in Ukraine and, and beyond. And please join me uh, in thanking Elisabetta Herman for 
the wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. And for her interesting point of view.